There exists a Bible verse that Christians love to throw around to try and discredit atheists. Psalm 14.1 states, That fool has said in his heart, There is no God. I would propose that people who say this have no idea who the true fools really are. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the true fools are ones who believe there is only God, that no other forces exist, that humanity's actions, achievements, and collective body of knowledge are all manifestations of God's will. Aside from the fact that God has never been conclusively shown to exist, there is a profound arrogance in thinking that one's God produces all good in humanity. And this arrogance is proudly displayed in today's subject video, which is a show called Focal Point. Emerging from the bowels of American Family Radio, the mouthpiece of a conservative echo chamber known as the American Family Association, and hosted by Brian Fisher, a former pastor in Chaplain for the Idaho Senate. This show will take us on a tour of the haughtiness and falsehoods at work among the religious right. This is Venomous Woe, and I will be scooping fish out of pet store aquariums with a rusty spoon. Hi, and welcome back to this second hour of Focal Point on AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. Great to have you with us. Great to have you in the conversation. We'll oh, trust me. You won't want me in the conversation by the time I'm done with you. I just want to begin, if I can grab that story. <laughs> well, there it is. Um, yeah, this is the, uh, the, the anniversary of the birth date of Alexis de Tocqueville, and I was reminded of this uh, this morning. Reminded about his two-part work, Democracy in America. He wrote this in 1835. This was after he traveled all across the United States in 1831. Now, he came from France. He was a social scientist from France. Went through the entire length and breadth of the United States, and he recorded his observations about what he saw in the United States. Now, One thing that struck me about this bit on Alexis de Tocqueville is that Fisher got the facts pretty much right here. It will prove to be a stark contrast to the utter crap that he spews for the rest of the video, and will seem to suggest that he suffers from selective history syndrome. Remember, France had had a, a revolution. It was a bloody uh, revolution. It was an anti-God uh, revolution. Uh, it was against the, the Catholic Church. It was against Christianity. They exalted reason as their goddess. In fact, they went into the largest Catholic church in France, Notre Dame. They put uh, some kind of statue up on the altar in the church, worshipped it as the goddess reason. Remember what I said about Fisher's selective history syndrome? It starts here. The French Revolution was brought about largely due to economic hardship and the aristocracy being complete knobs to the populace, rather than a hatred of God. Wars under the leadership of King Louis XIV caused massive debt, and the hardship was only exacerbated with a tax system that exempted the nobility and the clergy. Many found this unfair, and the seething anger of the lower classes reached a boiling point during a political meeting, where after having their motion of all participants having an equal vote spurned by the king, lower class participants organized and declared themselves the National Assembly. They stated that they were the will of the people, and that they would not dissolve until the government drafted a constitution. When the king took military action against the assembly, all hell broke loose. The reason why Fisher is claiming that the revolution was won against God is because about midway through the revolution, a radical group called the Jacobins staged a violent coup, and a revolutionary by the name of Maximilian Robespierre became head of the Committee of Public Security and orchestrated the Reign of Terror. Now, the Jacobins were influenced by writings from the Enlightenment-era philosophers, who were known for their brazen criticisms of religion and religious institutions. And since the Catholic Church opposed the revolution, clergy were seen as enemies. So while the revolution did take an anti-religious turn, Fisher is being dishonest by flat out saying it was a revolution against God and glossing over the details. And if you think it stops here, don't worry, it gets better. He came to the United States... He traveled, and here's what he observed about our country. And, and again, I want to preface this by saying, look, do not let anybody lie to you and tell you that this was not founded as a Christian nation. Captain, we have a problem. What is it, Ensign? We are detecting an intellectual anomaly, sir. 
It appears to be a concentration of bullshit with a volume of 5,342 anti-neurons. It originated from the vocal cords of one Brian Fisher, and is threatening to cause IQ loss among the populace. <gasps> EGAD! Ensign, inform the gunnery crew to power up the Logistos cannons. We must stop this anomaly. It shall not pass. Seriously, the idea that the U.S. was founded as a Christian nation is so ignorant of history, it makes me throw up in my mouth. The founders drew upon a number of secular, non-Christian influences to draft the Constitution. Among these were Enlightenment philosophers such as Baron de Montesquieu, John Locke, and David Hume, as well as the Athenian democracy and the Roman Republic. As if that weren't enough, several American documents throughout history paint a picture contradictory to Fisher's. Article 11 of the Treaty of Tripoli opens with, as the government of the United States is not, in any sense, founded on the Christian religion. Thomas Jefferson wrote of a wall of separation between church and state in a letter to the Danbury Baptists. James Madison, in his detached memoranda, wrote, Strongly guarded as is the separation between religion and government in the Constitution of the United States, the danger of encroachment by ecclesiastical bodies may be illustrated by the precedents already furnished in their short history. And for the final blow, the Constitution does not mention God, Jesus, or anything else that would suggest a Christian inspiration once in the entire document. Everything he just said is essentially intellectual flatulence. Keep spewing methane-laced falsehoods, Fisher. You seem to be good at it. Anybody says to you this was not founded as a Christian nation is lying to you, or they are ignorant, or they are uninformed, or they are uneducated, or some combination thereof. Here All those adjectives describe you up to this point. Keep rubbing that cognitive dissonance into yourself, baby. Here's what the Tocqueville wrote. Upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. And the longer I stayed there, the more I perceived the great political consequences resulting from this new state of thing. The great political consequences of the fact that he observed this pronounced and profound religious aspect to life in America. In France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom marching in opposite directions. So freedom's marching this way. Religion is marching this way. They are pulling against each other. But in America, he says, I found they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. So both Christianity, which is what he means by religion, and liberty reigned together. They were united, intimately connected, and they reigned together in common over the same country. Alert! Alert! Mind quote has been detected. Set intellectual dishonesty purge phasers to maximum. Unfortunately for Fisher, Alexis de Tocqueville's book is freely available via the Gutenberg Project. Therefore, anyone can see that he's quoting out of context. Upon examination of the passages that he cites, immediately after the bits he claims support the idea of a Christian U.S., Tocqueville goes on to state that, to each of these men, the men in question being Catholic priests, I expressed my astonishment, and I explained my doubts. I found that they differed upon matters of detail alone, and that they mainly attributed the peaceful dominion of religion in their country to the separation of church and state. So Tocqueville is not arguing that the U.S. is successful because the government is Christian. Quite the opposite. Better whip out that Google-proof vest, Fisher, because the facts will get in the way of your argument. Uh, the founders brought with them a form of Christianity, which I cannot better describe than by styling it a democratic and republican religion. Wait, did he just say that the founders brought religion with them to America? The founders weren't even alive at the time of the pilgrims. Not only has he checked his scholarship at the door, but apparently his sense of time, too. From the earliest settlement of the immigrants, politics and religion contracted an alliance which has never been dissolved. Now, this is 1831. Remember, America basically was formed 1607 or 1620, if you want to talk about the pilgrims. So he's talking here about well over 200 years of experience. America was not formed in the 1600s. Being settled and colonized does not count as forming an independent sovereign nation. And also, there were settlers that arrived on the American mainland before 1607. 
Or was the Spanish landing in Florida just a figment of collective imagination? And he says, look, the alliance between politics and Christianity in America has never been dissolved. Religion in America, he says, must be regarded as the foremost of the political institutions of that country. Am I the only one who thinks this entire argument is an appeal to authority and a bad one at that? Just because Alexis de Tocqueville thinks that religion and politics are intertwined does not necessarily make it so. It is his opinion that this is so. It is not a fact. And frankly, the notion that you're treating it like a fact troubles me. In other words, what de Tocqueville observed, there is no separation between church and state in America. There's no separation between Christianity and politics in America. In fact, Christianity, the church, is the foremost of the political institutions of the United States. By foremost, he means it's the most important. It's the paramount political institution. It's the most important, most influential political institution uh, that exists. The United States doesn't regard religions as political institutions. We don't even have a state church for Pete's sake. For if it does not impart a taste for freedom, it facilitates the use of it. So he says Christianity imparts to America its taste for liberty. You mean that same taste for liberty that manifested itself so brilliantly in medieval and Renaissance Europe and the Spanish Inquisition? Where does that hunger for freedom come from? Well, it comes from Christianity. This is what de Tocqueville observed. 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? There is liberty. Using Bible verses to prove Christianity's taste for freedom? Oh, dear. And he said, look, there's all kinds of denominations. He uses the word sex, S-E-C-T-S. Uh, our word for that today would be denominations. He says all the sects or denominations of the United States are comprised within the great unity of Christianity and Christian morality is everywhere the same. So he said, look, you've got all these different denominations. You would think there'd be this enormous division. No, there's this tremendous unity. There is an absolute unity about Christian morality. What's he talking about? Talking about the moral standards of the Ten Commandments everywhere accepted in America because of the influence of Christianity. You've got to be joking. There is so division among the denominations of Christianity. The entire Protestant movement was intended as a ginormous middle finger to the Catholic Church for their perceived spiritual crimes. Saying that all these divisions are united because they fit under the umbrella of the Ten Commandments is bogus. Is this what passes for intellectual honesty in your mind? If so, I shudder to think of what else you could justify. In the United States, he goes on, the sovereign authority is religious. Notice that. In the United States, the sovereign authority is religious, not political. The sovereign authority, the main authority, the most influential authority in America is a religious authority from Christianity. They're yeah, I'm sure. Is that why there are so many priests in the Senate or so many bishops on the Supreme Court or so much legal precedent covering the appropriate expressions of religious belief in a government setting? In other words, what, what de Tocqueville is saying, if you want to look for one word that explains the greatness of the United States of America, one word that explains the exceptionalism of the United States of America, that word is Christianity. According to de Tocqueville, it is because of Christianity that America is free. It is because of Christianity that America is stable. It is because of Christianity that America is prosperous. Uh, it is because of Christianity that there is liberty and political freedom uh, in uh, America. Uh, and America is what it is because the Christian religion has kept the greatest real power over men's souls. I'm sorry, I guess you were trying to make a point, but I couldn't hear it over all the ideological masturbation and the cries of non-Christian citizens demanding credit for their contributions to the nation. And nothing better demonstrates how useful and natural it is to man since the country where it now has the widest sway is both the most enlightened and the freest. Well, considering that the U.S. has the, among the lowest percentage of college graduates in the developed world, I'm inclined to disagree with you that our country is enlightened. As for the freedom bit, freedom is not something you can quantitatively measure. So you're basically using subjective terms in an objective context. So again, I, I, I want to reiterate, 
You know, we believe in American exceptionalism. Why? Uh, because we understand and we see the influence that Christianity has had. It, it is Christianity. It is Christ. It is the spirit of Christ that has made the United States the exceptional nation that it is. And this may explain part of President Obama's antipathy toward the United States. It is his anti-Christian impulse, his anti-Christian energy, his anti-Christian animus that militates not only against Christianity, but militates against the nation that Christianity has produced, the exceptional nation of the United States of America. And here we go with the Obama conspiracy theories. Look, Obama's Christian. Sorry, just because he espouses a multicultural view of the world, as indicated in a 2004 interview with the Chicago Sun-Times on this exact subject, does not mean that he is not personally a Christian. Do I also need to tell you that he was born in Hawaii? Well, I think we're done here. I'll have a link to Fisher's video in the description, and I will have extra stuff you can read on the subjects I've covered as well. I was going to go on a lengthy tirade about the value of intellectual honesty and looking past one's personal beliefs, but I failed to see that what that would accomplish. It's likely that Fisher won't even see this video, and if he does, he'll likely just hand wave all my points. So I'm just going to cut it off here. This has been the Rusty Spoon, now in three different oxides. In 1831, nobody had questions about Christianity. Nobody challenged Christianity. The few people that did were laughed to scorn. Everybody accepted Christianity. It reigned by universal consent. Everybody in America, whether they were adherents or followers or believers or not, understood the importance and the salutary benefits of Christianity.